Well, good morning. So, I'm John Cunningham, and you may be wondering who I am and why I'm here preaching. Um, so you can read a little bit about me in the bulletin. I used to be a pastor a long time ago, and uh, most recently really a professor. Uh, I do that sort of adjunct now, and most of the time I now spend making pots on a potter's wheel. So well, um, kind of a diverse bit of thing. And, and the reason as to why I'm here, you may have heard the phrase, bottom of the barrel, um, but, but no, no, hopefully not. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> um, we are fairly new to, uh, to this church, um, maybe a year or so, and after COVID and all that, we were looking for a church, having moved to Fresno, and I just want to tell you about our first time here, because we really appreciated it. We were looking at different churches. We came here, and we heard Wren, right from the beginning, just talk about how everyone is welcome here, and how God loves us, and we're like, we were moved, you know? I think, obviously, most churches believe those sorts of things, and that God loves us, but it doesn't always get said, and, we, and to hear it was so life-giving for us, so we're grateful to you. We've really appreciated being here. Okay, well, today, as Kent mentioned, um, our face of faith is going to be Peter. Um, what I want to look at, though, we're all here on a bright, sunny, happy day in Hawaiian shirts, and I'm going to pick a really heavy theme. Sorry. Um, we want to look at, at Peter's failure. I want to look at our failures. And I want to look at how Peter handled his failure, and let's think about how we handle our failure. Um, we'll look at how we deal with them spiritually. We're going to compare how Peter handled his failure when he betrayed Jesus three times, if you remember the story, um, and compare that to how Judas handled betraying Christ, uh, who did it very differently. I'm going to fall off this thing if I wander around. Um, and we'll, give it, we'll also compare how Peter handled his failing of Christ and compare it with how um, Peter dealt with his own sinfulness three years earlier when he was first being called by Jesus, because it was very different. So we're going to get one of those rare stories in the Bible where you see somebody grow spiritually. You see a lot of conversions in the Bible where somebody didn't believe and then came to faith. But to see somebody grow, which is the process we're in, we're going to get to see that in Peter's life today. Um, I think we're going to see something beautiful in Peter's growth, a, a real change, and it's one that moves me, and I think it will probably move you too. Um, but to do that, we're thinking about Peter's failure. As you recall, um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, um, right after the, the Lord's Supper, uh, where, where Peter had said, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you to death, three times before the cock crowed, as you recall, Peter denied he even knew Jesus. Now, this was his... This was Jesus' darkest hour. He's scared. He's alone. He's suffering. And his friend, who had sworn eternal loyalty to him, denies even knowing him. Not once, not twice, but three times. And I think he cussed about it. It's with an oath, he says. He's, he's cussing, saying, I don't know him. This was Peter's worst moment, right? Um, because I'm sure he was scared. I'm not sure I wouldn't have done the same thing. I'm sure he was tired. It was the middle of the night. And there are so many things that make us understand how somebody could do that. But in the end, all those reasons, what he did was just rotten. A betrayal of his friend, his savior, his God, and the excuses don't really take that away. Now, on this heavy theme here, what I want to do, if you, can, if you can stand it, and if this is going to be hard for you, then just don't do it. But I'd like to take a, a, just a, a couple seconds of silence and think about those failures in your life that there's lots of reasons for, but in the end you feel like maybe there's just no excuse. It was just a rotten thing. Um, some, most of us have these, these kind of things. Often they have to do with how we treat our, have treated someone in our family or our 
uh, breaches in honesty or sexuality or something, but they're things that, that we do that make us feel guilty. Um, and often it's because we are guilty of uh, something. So if you can stand it, just to make this come alive a little bit, I'd like you to not just think about Peter's moment of failure, but, but your own. Again, if this is too upsetting right now, I'm, I'm serious, just don't do that. There's no need. But if you can, if you can go there... Let's just take a couple seconds and get that feeling and that thought in your head. <clears throat> All right, again, I'm sorry to do that to you on a Hawaiian shirt day, but um, the reason I want to do this is because I think all of us, some of the time, and some of us, almost all the time, are struggling with guilt not feeling good about ourselves. Sometimes it's guilt, sometimes it's just a general sense of shame that there's just something wrong with us. Maybe God is mildly fed up with us. Maybe, yeah, he'll let us into heaven because he's loving, but he must be kind of annoyed, must be kind of disappointed. Um, Sometimes we feel those kind of things. If you don't feel those kind of things, I think you should rejoice and thank God that you're psychologically healthy enough But for most of us, we struggle with this, at least some of the time. And again, for some of us, it's almost all the time, just feeling bad about ourselves. So I want us to think about that. And let's read our scripture, if we can, this morning. Because I want you to see, remember, this is is the first time Peter is going to have a one-on-one interaction with Jesus after doing that to him, after cussing and swearing he didn't even know him. Right after betraying him when he just said he'd, he'd give his life for him. This is going to be his first one-on-one interaction with him. And I want you to see. So as you hear the scripture read, again, put your mind in an imaginative state if you can. Don't just try to understand what's being said. That's important. But see if you can put yourself in the scene. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you feeling? Who are you identifying with? Just see what strikes you as we read the scripture this morning. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, it's probably John, um, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. All right, what a, there's so much there, but what I, what I want to stress right now is this is the first time that he's going to have, Peter's going to have a one-on-one interaction with someone he's betrayed. There's been real betrayal, real perfidy, um, harm done, and when he hears that it's Jesus, he gets his stuff, because he's stripped for work, and cannot wait for them to row the boat in. I can't take that much time i got to get to Jesus now. And he jumps over the side of the boat, and a fisherman becomes a 100-meter Olympic swimmer. Um, and he's he just not going to wait. The other guys have to bring the boat in. He can't wait to get to Jesus. And I find that surprising. And I find that beautiful. What did he come to know about Jesus that when he had really blown it, 
He didn't cower away from him. He didn't keep his distance. He didn't do like Judas um, and self-destruct. He ran to Jesus. What did he, what did he know? What did he learn? <clears throat> because this is very different from how Judas handled guilt, isn't it? If you, there's a couple of different stories in the Bible uh, about what Jesus did, Judas did after he betrayed Christ for the 30 pieces of silver. Um, but they both end in his self-destruction, maybe he hung himself. Guilt can do that to people. Shame can do that to people. Living with our failures, where there's no awareness of God's love and mercy and understanding and kindness and forgiveness, leads us to self-destruct one way or the other. Maybe, maybe it's dramatic like Judas. Maybe it's just giving up, tuning out and watching TV. Maybe it's just drinking way too much every night. But those seem to be dramatic options. Run to Jesus because you can't wait to get there and be with him or self-destruct. But I think it's interesting, too, <clears throat> to compare Peter's response of just, I can't wait to get to Jesus when I have done something I'm ashamed of. Um, not only to compare that to Judas, but to compare it to Peter himself, who three years earlier had a super similar situation and responded very differently. In Luke 5.8, um, we, we read that the same miracle happened. I think this was Jesus having a great time. I think he's He's just playing at this point. When he called Peter, he did the same trick, the same miracle of like, hey, you didn't catch anything all night, right? Put the, the, the net on the other side of the boat. And when that happened back at the beginning, when Peter was being called, and they caught all those fish at that, and Peter knew he was in the presence of God, of holiness, of wonder. He just fell on his knees, and it, in, in Luke 5.8 it says this, but when Simon Peter saw it, this miracle, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Just the opposite response of three years later, where he knows he's sinful. And again, some of us, it's not just guilt about a particular thing that we've done, but there's a sense of shame. Just generally, I'm bad. I'm a bad person. And we carry that around. And it seems like maybe you had some of that. I'm a sinful man. I'm just kind of a bad person. You should go away from me. You're holy. And three years later, when he did something actually bad, he can't wait to get to him. Now, I want to um, see how could this happen? Now, if you read this passage in John 21, the last chapter of the book, um, we, we find out this is the third time that Jesus appeared after the resurrection. <clears throat> and here's what he did the very first time when he came to some of the disciples. The first thing he said to them, and he said it twice, when he, the first time he showed up to them, can, can you guess what he might say to the disciples after the resurrection? Here's what he said, because it gets said in the Bible all the time from God to humans. Peace be with you. He knows we're upset. He knows we're struggling. He knows we're hurting. He knows we're not doing all that well half the time. And so what does he say? Repeatedly in the Bible, but especially here. Look, please be at peace. Be at peace. It's okay. It's okay. I've got this. So he says that, and then he shows him the crucifixion wounds, and he breathes the Holy Spirit on them and says, you're my people. Go, go bring goodness into the world. But Thomas wasn't there, as you remember. So the second time that Jesus appears, um, Thomas is there. And what does he say? Peace be with you. Seems to be like he's trying to get us insecure, upset, guilt-ridden, worrisome people a point here. Like, be at peace. All is well. All is well, and all manner of things shall be well, as Julian of Norwich would say. And uh, T.S. Elias would repeat, be at peace. And again, he has um, Thomas touch 
the wounds. He's pointing out the crucifixion yet again. And in this encounter, when, when uh, Peter makes it to shore, um, Jesus is making breakfast on the beach, and the, the um, disciples really come to see the fullness of who Jesus is when he breaks the bread. He's alluding again to the Last Supper, to the crucifixion, to this is my body given for you. So somehow, in all this, there's this message in our failure of peace. The crucifixion, Christ's sacrifice. If you feel like, man, some of this stuff, this bad stuff just deserves punishment somehow, well, if it does, it was um, fully met in Christ, right? I mean, that was... Crucifixion was about as bad as suffering can get. If there needs to be punishment, if there does, that certainly covered it. I don't really know how the atonement works, but if it needs punishment, boy, it was sure covered. Um, and uh, so he, he, he's like, this, all this sin is covered. As Kent um, keeps re- reminding me to my great benefit, the thing that Jesus said was, it is finished on the cross, right? It's okay. It's done. Everything's all right now. It's done. You're, it's good. It's finished. All of it has been done. So after this, too, if you read in this chapter, after the breakfast is the famous part where Jesus three times asked Peter, do you love me? And he just keeps asking him, and Peter's getting really upset. And every time um, Peter says yes, Jesus says, then, then take care of my people, feed my sheep, take care of people. Love. Go out and love then. If you, if you love me, go love on people. And he does this three times. So Peter, after this big failure, is restored and commissioned and given something good from God to do, just like you, right? Just like me. In our failure, it doesn't disqualify you. He, he's like, peace be with you. My crucifixion, my suffering covers all of this. And you're commissioned. Go, go and bring love into the world. All right, in closing, what I'd like to do is see if you'll imagine with me one more time and do a little meditative imagination. And I want you to think about, what if you actually believed this? What would happen in your life? What if you actually believed that God himself in Christ is offering you peace? He really is. What if he is? Just I want us to imagine that. What would it be like if he's repeatedly offering you peace? He's he's, he's trying to make a point. I would like you to have peace. What if we believe that? What if Jesus is actually stressing his work on the cross, takes away the sin of the world, and takes away your sin? It's gone. It is white as snow, even if it was scarlet. And what if it is true that Jesus restores, and he provides for you, he feeds you, and that Jesus loves you. So I want to just take a second in closing. And uh, before the moment passes, turn your imagination to what would your life be like if you believed what we're being told in this passage about your failure, uh, your no's just can't stand against God's yeses. What if that's true? Let's, Let's just take a moment and think about that. May it be. Amen.